You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means it is time to kick off our broadcast week here once again on the old Options Insider Radio Network. It is time for the Option Block, your bi-weekly options extravaganza, what the cool kids call the old OB. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the aforementioned network. I will be your host, your guide, your mater D, taking you to your options table throughout the week, a shortened week, obviously, Due to the holiday, no shows on Friday, but everything else coming at you throughout the week. Got a great OB coming up for you in a few minutes. Crypto Rundown, great guest after that a little bit later today. Tomorrow, great pro Q&A. Got the Viceroy back. You folks were excited about him, so we got him back to wear his jaunty caps and answer all of your favorite and pressing options questions. That's tomorrow. Of course, Wednesday, got your double dose of education, options boot camp, options playbook radio. Thursday, episode due of the option block, as well as Twifo. Before the Christmas Eve holiday shuts everything down out there. And of course, you can listen after the fact <laughs> on just about every platform under the sun on demand. If you want to join us live throughout the week, you want to get access to the pro Q&As, options oddities, the trading crate giveaways, all the other cool stuff that we do. The optionsinsider.com slash secret club. Remember, just me and you here. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell your friends. It's really a secret. Just for us. All right. And no, it's not a secret. Well, maybe it is, but it's the best kept secret in the game right now because I know pretty much all of you love it, except for that one guy who wrote in a couple of weeks ago. If you're that one guy, if you don't appreciate the art and the majesty that is the 80s wrestling endeavor, you know that's how we have to kick off our broadcast week here, listeners. It's our favorite game. It is time to play. Can you name that 80s wrestling? I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, first off, quick hint. This one probably my least favorite gimmick of all time. It's up there with the most hated gimmicks of all time, I know. And for me personally, given the heritage of this person before they were this gimmick, I find it doubly repulsive to me. Also, it's one of those good old school themes where they say the name every like 30 seconds. I'm going to do some strategic muting here, but we'll see if we can pull this off. Can you name that 80s wrestler?
right, let's just leave it there because I keep saying the name and I'm going to miss it on my next bit of strategic muting. That's my hint for you out there, listeners. This, to me, my least favorite, dare I say it, the most offensive gimmick to me of all time. Let's go around the horn now. Let's see who we've got beaming in to us today to kick things off by naming that 80s wrestler. First, let's go out. He's had a decent showing of late. Let's see if he can keep it up throughout the end of the year. Of course, he is the Undertaker's neighbor these days down there in Austin, so he should know a thing or two about a thing or two. He is the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mr. Meatball, A, welcome back to the program, and B, can you name this, which is, to me, the worst gimmick of all time, sir? So I'm trying to go through a couple of the really bad ones, and, you know, it kind of sounds like the Repo Man, but... Wow, you got it, yes! That yeah. was the Repo Man. Totally. You Wow. I hated I'm impressed. Repo man. I even did my strategic my sec- muting. Yeah, no, it sounds like something that a Repo Man would do. Uh, that, is, that is my second, I think, worst gimmick of the 80s. Uh, I think we can unilaterally say that Akeem the African Dream uh, was not only... <laughs> a Chicagoan, by the way. A Chicagoan oh. pulling that gimmick off. Well, I mean, he, the problem was they had taken... What was hands down one of the best gimmicks, the one man gang, and then taken him and turned him into some off- not only stupid but patently offensive uh, gimmick. Can and- you imagine that gimmick today? Can you imagine WWE rocking that gimmick today? <laughs> I mean, it was terrible. But the Repo mm. Man was absolutely one of the dumbest things. And you know who the Repo Man was, right? Well, that's why it, to me, is the most offensive gimmick of all time. Because I mean, it was it was one half of your. Favorite. It was the legacy of demolition became this this monstrosity, this unholy monstrosity for all of us. Yeah, they took demolition, smashed. dismantled them, and they made him the Repo Man. <laughs> Just the worst. Listeners, if you haven't seen this gimmick, look it up. It is a tro. It's exactly what you think. It's some guy like in a crappy mask. And just this terrible music sneaking around. Oh, just just absolutely. The going from the heights of the greatest tag team of all time, which we have all collectively agreed upon, which is Demolition, to go to this, it's it's one of the, the most epic falls from grace in uh, WWE. All because Vince wasn't a fan, I guess. The Demolition guys had a bit of a falling out with Vince. And <laughs> Repo Man was part of the result. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, let's go out to you now. I know, A, you agree that, you know, Demolition, just re- reinforcing for you Demolition. A, the greatest tag team of all time. But B, what are your thoughts on this? Kind of just one of the worst, if not the worst. A lot of people hate the Red Rooster, too. I don't have any personal animosity towards the Red Rooster. But for me, it's got to be Repo Man. Well, when you said that, my first, that was when you said it was the worst gimmick ever, that was my first one. I think the Red Rooster was a little bit worse than the Repo Man, honestly. But um, they're both bad, no question about that. Um, the other one, I was just trying to think of things that Longo would hate. And uh, so the other one, I didn't know if you'd hate him or not, but uh, just the fact that you you said you hated him, I was thinking the Big Boss Man, but didn't oh. say anything about Cobb County, Georgia, the the song. So the song uh, is a little. Uh, I don't know if it would pass muster these days, but I love the gimmick. I love the Big Boss Man. Sure. Yeah, I love the Big Boss Man. He was a he was also one of my favorites. But I figured you might hate him because he was like a Southern guy, and so oh, maybe. Uh, you know, I hate all things think- south of the Mason Dixon line. That's just me. Diehard Northerner mm-hmm. Yankee that I am. <laughs> That's what made me think of it first. But no, the fact I, I would agree, Repo Man was terrible, and um, uh, him and Crush were equally bad. Oh, so. Crush! Yeah, we don't even speak of Crush on this network. That's uh, that's that's another. All the the later iterations of Demolition we do not speak of, listeners. Instead, let's honor that one guy's request and let's dive on into the markets. It is time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show where we break down everything that was trading out there today. And man, a lot of things are trading all firmly in the red. You know, we've been doing this dance for a while now, listeners, ever since the Omicron thing really kicked off again in earnest back on Black Friday. We saw that big sell-off, and almost every session since then has kind of been like, are we going to do that again, or are we going to buck the trend and rally? And then that's kind of been the dance we've been playing 
every day, kind of aggressive sell-off or aggressive rally. Sometimes the worm turns intra-session and we go from a sell-off to a rally or vice versa. And today we are firmly in the red camp, listeners. All the major indices are off pretty hard, threatening the 2% level. Remember, just a few sessions ago, it was NASDAQ off over 2%, and the Dow kind of rallying and unched on the day. So we've seen some of those mixed weird days, too. Today, not the case. Everything's off across the board. NASDAQ and Dow both off a little over 1.8%. Uh, the S&P threatening one and three quarters percent. NASDAQ, by the way, threatening correction territory now. 2% the other day, almost 2% again today. So coming to showtime, we did see vol a lot higher out there earlier in the session. It seems like, as we have seen many times, outside of the beginning of this sell-off, when the Omicron thing really kicked in, Ball stayed bid for the better part of a week, which is very rare. Today, of course, we're seeing what we normally see. We see the aggressive sell-off, Vol pops, and then once it's clear that we're selling off, we're going to keep selling off, but maybe the, the entire world is not on fire, then we see Vol coming in. VIX Cash hit a high of about 26, a little over 26 early this morning. Coming into showtime, we had given up about a point of that, back to about 25. Still up firmly from our last show, but up only four and a half points as opposed to over five, like it was earlier in the session. VVIX back up at those pandemic frothy levels, listeners. 152 and three quarters when we kicked off the show. That's up over 25 points from this time last show. Uh, VXX and UVXY, you know, the two products that everybody loves to fade, love to erode to the dark side. Getting back a nice week and change's worth of, of erosion out there. When we kicked off the show, a VXX was at a 24 and a quarter. That had given up a lot. That was, it was easily almost 25 right before we kicked, not that long before we kicked off the show, within an hour. It gave up about half a point in that time. So these products are starting to give up the ghost again. And UVXY was at about an 1865 when we kicked off the show. That one was north of 19, not that long before showtime. Looks like it topped out at about a 1913. Again, this is a product that was... Threatening the 15 handle not too long ago, listeners. So UBXY getting the lift, hanging out that 1865 level. And Vol Q, a.k.a. the at the money vol of the NASDAQ at about a 26 and a half. That's up three and a quarter points from this time last week. So a lot more juice on the screen right now than there was this time on Thursday. Let's go back around the horn. He got it right. So he gets to kick things off. Mr. Meatball, sir, in addition to your love of the repo man, which all of us hold near and dear to our hearts, of course. Uh, what's lighting up your tape out there in the markets today, sir? Yeah, no, the, this market is is messy, kind of like the gobbledygooker. Uh, it is just <laughs> an, an, a, a kind of a mess. Quality gimmicks uh, across the board. The qu- gobbledygooker may be worse than all of them. Uh, your buddy Taker but, almost was the gobbledygooker. Next time you see him, you should remind him of that. Oh, uh, I will. I will. Um, we're now off three days in a row in the S&P. Uh, the, the Russell is in a lot of pain, the Russell 2000, the NDX, the Dow, all, all really low. The thing I think is kind of interesting is we've got the mega caps down, although they've recovered off the lows, but we're seeing some of the more kind of hated or trendy, you know, or low, what are they, low P&L names get a little bit of a bid. Uber's been up today. Um, you know, they're not... Are, you know, a lot of the ARC held names are not in as much pain as maybe we'd, we would expect. And um, Carnival Cruise Lines had earnings this morning, and you're seeing CCL up, and, and a lot of the transportations are actually up. American Airlines is up. Uh, Delta was up earlier. It's now flat. Um, and then outside of that, the only other areas where there's really any any buying, you got Pfizer up a little bit on Omicron, but you know my my feeling is fade that, and uh, you know some AT and T is up despite, it, but that's about it. Um, pretty red across the board, and but not not all in the spots that I would you would expect. Industrials, financials, energy getting smoked, uh, XLK down big, but. Uh, a lot of the other names not nearly in the same kind of pain. Let's go out now to the land of St. Charles. This is normally where I could turn for my resident permable, the guy who could talk up any bear market, turn it into a bull market. He loves a bit of green on the screen. Uncle Mike, I don't know if even you can talk up this market today, sir. So what is what is Uncle Mike feeling on a day that is decidedly not Uncle Mike, sir? Well, in looking at this, uh, so couple things. Uh, yes, I totally agree with Mark. This is red across the board, and uh, there's no two, there's no other which way about it in terms of where we're at with it. 
Uh, metals, or I'm just looking at silver, uh, not a lot of movement in there. It's pretty much flat on the day. Uh, but with this, a couple things that uh, will give us hope or will give some uh, thought on the case for the bulls, if you will. Uh, we're not really rallying that much in the 10-year note right now. And so I believe that if this was a lot of paranoia, if this was uh, a lot of true fear, that we'd be 10-year note would be being bought a lot more right now than what it's being bought. Uh, we're actually at levels similar to where we were last Friday at certain points during the day on the 10-year note. Uh, so that's one thing to where if real big money was concerned of this market going down, I think we'd have a little bit more flight to safety. So that's one thing that I'm seeing on this. Uh, the other thing is that with the S&P, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I believe it was December 3rd, uh, we actually were around these levels. So I think the low that we got to this month on December 3rd, uh, the low of the day that day was 44.95. So in other words, 4,500 is kind of a level that we've been to and that we bounced off of uh, a couple, roughly two and a half weeks ago. So in looking at that, there is a case for the bulls to be made around that level. And we're not at that level yet. Uh, just looking at the S&P right now, we're 40 points above it right now. But uh, we are getting close to that. So if you're looking at this as a longer term trend and you're looking for a pullback to get in on something, this may be an opportunity. Uh, with all of our longer term holdings, of course, we're still in them at, at RCM. Uh, we're still continuing to do things at the strategic night, triple income, uh, our dividend programs, things like that. We're still in things. We haven't taken any action whatsoever with that uh, based on this pullback. But my aggressive strategy that I use with clients, I have been in cash. I've been very sparing with getting into and getting out of this market so far in December. And so, um, I'm going to be looking for opportunities later in the day today to possibly uh, sell a put spread on the SPX or the SPY, whatever size the account is, whatever the case may be. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to do it yet, but that's something that I am going to be looking to do a little bit later in the day. Just I want to see how the afternoon trading plays out. Uh, if you look at things throughout the day today, uh, we're at uh, similar levels as to where we were uh, roughly an hour into the market today. So the market really has been well, kind of boring uh, for the last three hours, but it was uh, took a big sell-off right at the open, and a little bit of it uh, happened in the, in the overnight market as well. So I believe we were down uh, roughly 60, 70 points at one point overnight in the S&P E-mini, and then, of course, we had a continued, uh, we rallied a little bit going into the open. And then, of course, we're having continued sell off the first hour. But since then, it's been relatively stable. And so it's just for those reasons that uh, not putting my money where my mouth is yet, but I might be a little bit later in the day. So that's uh, what I'm seeing right now. Uncle Mike potentially nibbling at some put spreads out there. Listen, what are you folks up to? Are you, gonna, are you looking at some put spreads to the dark side? And our chat kicking things off this morning was saying, how about them puts? They were very excited. So <laughs> I guess they had some downside puts that or perhaps they were looking forward to breaking through their strike and getting some S&P or whatever their index of choice is at a lower level. Let's keep on going now into the most active. Let's see. Let's, let's start off in the big indices as we are wont to do is go out to VIX land first, you know. The ADV for VIX has been surging of late. It is over 700,000. It remains right about that level right now. 704,000 is the ADV out there. And so far on a strong pace to hit it. <laughs> Already nearly 500,000 contracts on the tape. 495 as of a few minutes ago. So it looks like VIX once again going to be breaking that 700K level. Which is good because if you listen to Vol Views on Friday. You know, not every day this past week was a barn burner from an overall VIX options. And last Monday was the kind of the nadir of the week from a volume perspective. So. Kicking things off on a Monday with some actual paper. Not the worst thing, even if it is not exactly a great day for the Bulls out there. Spy also doing some numbers. 3.92 million contracts on the tape right now. The ADV almost 5.7 million out there. Yes, closing in on a million contracts. You know it's a busy day when around this time the S is threatening or over a million. You know it's pretty active. Right now, 967,000 contracts. The ADV right around, it's been glued to 1.6 million for a while. It's still pretty much right there. 1.63 million is the ADB. And the S-Land Qs 
Again, north of a million already again for the Qs, 1.17 million on the tape. The ADB is threatening 2 million out there now, 1.9 million. So the Qs have been on fire. And again, like I said, they're threatening a correction. So not a surprise there. And small caps also have been on fire of late, usually in the wrong direction for the last couple of weeks if you're a small cap bull. We had that ever so brief Santa Claus rally, the, the once in future Dr. Bix called it with some eerily precise timing. We got it for about a week, maybe two, and that's just annihilation out there ever since. But we're seeing some numbers out there again today. Small caps, at least the IWM flavor, 643,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, the ADV out there, 1.09 million. We're over a million ADV now in IWM. That was 535,000, almost pretty much half of that, <laughs> not too long ago. So small caps have really just roared to life here in Q4, which is, and again, from a volume perspective, not from a price action perspective let's get out to the uh, single names what's lighting up the tape out there today from a most active perspective and it's actually a surprisingly light day from that perspective remember we've seen many days of late 350 360 380 is what it costs you to break into the top 10 today nowhere close to that 210 that gets you all the way to carnival cruise lines a name that you would think the day when everything is getting annihilated out there and maybe reopening, not exactly on the tip of everybody's tongue. More lockdowns and tests and all that fun stuff. You think a name like Carnival will be getting annihilated, but they're popping off, actually. At least compared to everything else, they're not selling off 2%. They're actually bucking the trend up nearly 2% today. Uh, so Carnival Cruise Lines, number 10, 210,000 contracts. I think we'll get a little more into Carnival. They had earnings this morning. We'll get a little more into them in a second. Number nine, we have a good old AT&T, what the old timers used to call telephone. <laughs> 211,000 contracts. Number eight, Bank of America, 223,000 contracts. Number seven, Ford. Ford back in the top 10. It's kind of been hanging out there for the better part of the last couple of months. Ford actually giving some back today, 19 and a quarter or so right now, off about half a buck or nearly 3%. Number six, it's Neo. That's always a top tenner these days. 293,000 contracts. Number five, I get all the way at number five listeners, halfway through our top 10 before we break 300K. That shows you what a Interesting day. The indexes are putting up some numbers today. The single names, not as much. Pfizer, number 10, number five, 331,000 contracts. Number four, it's NVIDIA, another perennial top tenor these days, 363,000 contracts. Number three, only one half of the symbol twinology hanging out in the top 10 out there today. That's good old AMC, which actually, by the way, listeners, you guys are diving into this one already. It only went live a few minutes before showtime, but our question of the week has to do with the symbol twins and everything else out there. We asked you, Kind of something Mr. Meatball has been pontificating about on the show. A lot of people have been asking this of late. So we thought we would ask you, uh, quite simply, we kicked off the year riding the meme stock wave, but has the interest in names like AMC and GameStop and all their ilk begun to cool? Quite simply, is the meme stock wave dead? We gave you three choices, yes, no, or we always like to throw a fun curveball in there. This week, it's I prefer crypto. <laughs> and so far, nearly 70% of the early voting, 69.8% saying no. 25.6% saying yes, and about 5% almost, 4.7% saying you prefer crypto. It just went live right before Showtime listeners, so you got pretty much the rest of the week to get out there at options, make your voice heard, even though it seems like a lot of you already have. Let's get back to our top 10 out here. Like I said, number three, AMC. So far, at least today, AMC looking pretty robust. The apes have been at, at it again, trying to pop AMC. You saw that hashtag last week, AMC 500K. I'll, I'll let you have, make your own value judgments on that, lest I besmirch the apes and the rash of emails come flooding into the network again. Number two, it is Tesla. Only 581,000 contracts, listeners. That's not a lot for Tesla these days. And number one is Apple, also looking quite light. We've seen them well over 2 million contracts multiple times right now at this time of day. Today, only 1.16 million. I say only like that's nothing. But still, for Apple these days, that is not a lot. We've seen over a million contracts in just those top five you know, people have been loading up on these crazy Apple weekly calls. Maybe those calls aren't popping off today. Perhaps another sign that Worm may be turning out there in some of these names. Let's pull up Apple really quickly here. See what they're up to today. Are they giving up the ghosts? Well, some reason. Here we go. My system did not want to play ball with me. Off nearly two bucks, about one and three quarters. A little over 1%, right around 169 and a half. So selling off, but nowhere near the annihilation, perhaps you might expect. Maybe that's why we're not seeing a lot of paper. Out there. Speaking of paper, we are still seeing some earnings paper listeners. And just because we like you, freshly updated, hot off the presses from our friends over there at Orats. You got your earnings move, your earnings move results, your earnings season, and now your new earnings trades reports, all available, all freshly updated, all free. We love you over there at the options. 
insider.com. Click on the options, news, and articles tab. To begin your journey, just be warned, there's a lot of data there. You're going to love it. You're going to sink your teeth into it. You're going to be looking at it for hours. What's about this ticker? What about this ticker? Again, this is stuff you used to have to pay proprietary houses a lot of money to crunch reports that were a lot less insightful than these, and you're getting four of them. So (laughs) if you're not taking advantage of it, you are, dare I say it, silly. Let's go on out to what we have popping off. Again, we're kind of in the dregs of the season. We're waiting for the next one to kick off here. There's still some names popping off this week, including Carnival today before the bell. A Micron today, as well as Nike. Tomorrow, we got good old Rad, a.k.a. Rite Aid and General Mills. Wednesday, CarMax and Paychecks. And it kind of falls off for the holidays towards the end of the week. We have, again, updated earnings move results reports today for Carnival. Uh, let's go out there. Carnival, of course, CCL. They were at 18 and a quarter about going into their announcement today. They were pricing in nearly 6%. And they delivered only 2%. But again, some of that is kind of just the outperformance that they're showing against the broad market out there today. It's kind of hard to have an earnings report into a day when the market is just getting annihilated, listeners, because it kind of just sucks up all the oxygen in the room. But they had a nice run for a while there. They were at 1770 coming into this morning, 7067. And they rallied all the way up to 19 and a quarter. So they have been giving it up now. They're about 1865. So they're about 60 cents or so off those highs. But still a decent day for them, even though in the initial blush, they only outperform. In fact, actually, where they are right now, they're right back to where they were when we ran this report, 1865 or so. So they've only moved about net right now, only 2% compared to about 6% with what they were pricing in. Of course, if you wait a little longer, you might have a different result there. But Carnival, an interesting one. This is the name a lot of people have been looking at as kind of one of the go-to names for reopening. And Carnival's had quite the saga. Listen to our Options Oddities show if you haven't listened to hear some of the crazy paper we've seen out there, as well as some here on the Odd Block. On this show, it's just been a Palooza carnival trading as high as 31 and a half back when everyone was all fired up about reopening in June. And uh, these days now, 1864. So pretty much half of where it was (laughs) not that long ago out there, listeners. Intriguing times as we keep on rolling into the weird, the well, actually, no, we have some more names popping off this week. We'll get to those really quickly, then we'll get into the old odd block. Uh, Coming up this week, we have earnings reports here for Micron. They are today after the bell. 83 bucks exactly is where their stock was trading. That's very rare. They're pricing in five and a third. In the past, they've moved. Actually, I take that back. They were pricing in 631. In the past, they've moved 533. So interesting stuff. A little bit more juice. Again, you can argue anything that's, that touches a chip these days could have a little bit more juice on it. And we're seeing that in Micron. Nike, shoes, athletic wear, how are they doing? 161 and a third is what they were coming into this report. They're popping off today after the bell as well. They were pricing in 11 bucks, 1107. In the past, they moved 1019. So almost a full dollar's worth of extra juice out there. Again, given what we've seen of the past cycle, it's kind of hard to fault them. And then tomorrow before the bell, we have Rite Aid. They were at 1205 going into this report. They're pricing in a buck 75. In the past, they moved a buck 89. So actually a little bit lighter on the vol front, which is surprising. Let's go out to CarMax really quickly, too. Used cars has been an intriguing sector of late. They're on the 22nd before the bell. They're at 137 and a half is where they were trading. They're pricing in 11 bucks almost exactly. In the past, they moved 905. So they pretty much popped in two extra bucks worth of juice out there. Again, used cars, kind of a crazy segment out there right now. Of course, you can check all the rest of these for yourselves. Earnings move results, earnings season, and earnings trades reports for yourself over there at the website. Meanwhile, we got to keep on rolling. It's time to unleash the eye of Sauron. It is time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, welcome to the Odd Block, the portion of the show where we unleash our eye of Sauron upon the options market and see where it fixes its steely gaze. What kind of weird, wild, unusual activity will it highlight for us today? Let's, let's find out. First, we're going back to one of our old friends. It's been a little bit, but we're back to them again. This is Bloom Energy Corp, ticker symbol BE. This is a energy company out of San Jose. They do a lot of uh, solid oxide fuel cells and all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, trading right now, $19.84, ticker symbol BE. They're off about, not a good day, I should say, for them at all. 8.5% today. 
So a little bit of that Bloom coming off the rose. Let's go back out on the year that has been Bloom Energy. Quite the saga they've had. A year ago, they were 27 and a half bucks, so substantially north of where they are right now. And then they rallied hard, of course, in all the meme madness. They took off by February 5th. They hit their high for the year, which was forty four ninety five. So they went from twenty seven fifty five to forty four ninety five over the span of a couple of months. There, then they kind of gave it up again pretty quickly. By March eighth, they were back to twenty five thirty three. So they were actually below where they kicked off the year. They were a couple bucks below that level. Then they kept selling off. By May twelfth, they hit nineteen thirty one, and then they tried to rally. They got up to about twenty eight and a half almost on June twenty eighth. And then they kind of slowly sold off again. They hit their low for the year on October 4th, 1682. Since then, they've actually had a little bit of a rebound. Well, they tried to anyway, because they popped up again. They had, it looks like a nice report on the 22nd, because they went from 20 bucks pretty much to 28 and a half in the span of just a set, couple of sessions. And then they topped out in that recent rally up at 35.56 on November 8th. And then ever since then, they've been selling off again. So this is another one of these names. Now, I've said it before, these, these fuel cell names, they have a lot of fits and starts, and they've been doing it for decades now. And it looks like Bloom encapsulated that multiple times over the course of this past year. Right now, it's kind of back to you've had a rough year. We've lost almost 30% on this name. So it's a rough year for Bloom Energy holders. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron found. This looks like the kind of name, if I had to guess, I'm going to guess someone probably writing a bit of a line in the sand, maybe saying, hey, you know what, this sell-off, maybe it's overdone. I don't mind picking it up at these levels. And uh, let's see what we found out. Actually, look, looks like that was correct. My unusual activity radar starting to look pretty good. We got the Jan 15s, Jan 15 puts going up 11,169 times this morning for 16 cents, pretty much right off the bid. They were 15 cents at 25. If you're wondering, that's about an 80 vol, so that's nothing to sneeze at. And net premium, that isn't a ton. But vol wise, you're getting a little bit of, little bit of vol to squeeze out there. The stock was actually substantially higher when these went up. The stock was $20.92, so pretty much a buck higher. So these are clearly going to be bid in his face right now, which, again, kind of fails if the Rock Lobster was here, would fail his first rule of put selling, which is don't have them bid in your face the same day. Uh, their next earnings are in February. So this is not an earnings play. This looks like a straight up line in the sand, harvest a little bit of ye old premium. Mr. Meatball, what say you about this line in the sand and our old friend Bloom Energy, are you a fan or are you not a fan like the Repo Man? Well, I mean, 16 cents isn't a lot. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I mean, it's more than 1% yield over a month, but uh, it's still only 16 cents. Uh, I think there might be better ways to express the opinion that Bloom Energy is not going to drop, but I do understand the trade. Yeah, the thought process I can get behind, you're right. The premium level is kind of the one thing that's kind of holding me back. You want to do all this rigmarole for 16 cents. I mean, it's okay when we're joking around on options oddities, selling things and something like EDU, that's a $2 stock for 20, 25 cents. You're doing 16 cents in a, in a 19, $20 stock. It's a little bit of a different story. But still, perhaps he or she really wants to get that stock at around the 15 handle. We'll come back to this one. We'll see how this works out. Not a ton of juice. You like this one? It's not a bad level to pick up the stock at the end of the day. You're getting there below the 52-week low. So if you are a believer in Bloom, if these puts were put to you, I guess it wouldn't be the worst thing. We'll keep an eye on these. Speaking of keeping an eye on things, we have to, to start paying off some of these trades. Our eye of Sauron is starting to choke, tracking all of these trades for you folks, listeners. A bunch of them popped off last week on expiration. Let's see if we can get to a couple of them right now. Let's go back out now. Not, not exactly Bloom, but if you like power and energy companies, with a B ticker, <laughs> then we got you covered here. Let's go back to Ballard Power. They were another frequent offender not too long ago here on the show. In fact, we last talked about them on November 22nd, so almost a month ago. At the time, we profiled, once again, Line in the Sand Puts. This has kind of been the trade du jour on the show pretty much for the entirety of 2021, which is interesting. Everyone's talking about buying calls, and we certainly have seen a lot of those. But Line in the Sand Puts have been working out with a much greater frequency than the old buying of calls out there. But on November 22nd, we profiled some line in the sand puts in Ballard Power, pretty sizable as well, 26,110 of the DS 14 puts going up. Again, nominal amounts of premium we're seeing here, only 11 cents on these bad boys. They got a penny better than the bid. They were a dime bid at least. So they did get a little bit of price improvement. It's about a 60 vol, if you are wondering. 
The stock at the time was $16.77. And this failed. I know when we talked about it on the show back then, I believe the Rock Lobster was on. This failed his first criteria because they were instantly bid in this trader's face. So <laughs> that was an inauspicious beginning to this trade's life cycle. Let's see how it worked out. There were no, earning, no earnings in this trade, by the way. The next earnings is in March, so they got a little ways to go here. And let's look up really quickly Ballard Power over the past few months. And let's see. Right? He's actually <laughs> he's actually a pretty fortunate fellow. When we put the stock on, like I said, the stock was sixteen seventy seven. The stock has pretty much sold off uh, pretty aggressively. It actually did. It did break his strike. On the third, Ballard Power got down to 1323 before it bounced back up to 1445. And let's see. You know, we're getting some weird, some, some, I'm seeing some weird prints on these for some reason. We're going to table the Ballard Power for now because for some reason my system is not liking these. We're going to come back to these. Instead, let's go keep a little bit farther. Let's go also, you like Line of the Sands listeners. So I want to get Uncle Mike here for his block of strategery too. So let's go out to these really quickly. These are a little bit farther back. We're going back to Yelp. And some more line in the sand puts. In particular, this was November 8th. And we've got some line in the sand puts in Yelp. At the time, there was about 10,000, 9,845 of the DS 33 puts going up on the bid for 20 cents. So they just came in and crushed that bid. So if you want about 10,000 of these, how are they? And they just hit the bid. Uh, there's about a 42 vol listeners. The stock was almost 40 bucks, about 39.70. When this trade went up again, no earnings baked into this. The next earnings are in February. And so it looks like we, we, when we're talking about line of the sand puts, what's one of the first things we say, right, listeners? You got to be willing to take the stock there if you are so inclined. It seems like this person was not inclined to take the stock <laughs> because this one started selling off pretty hard. And this person panicked and got the hell out of Dodge because the stock, again, started taking just a, a massive hit. Let's see, it was at 39.69 when it went up and it quickly started selling off. By the first, it, it was down at 33 bucks. <laughs> so that was threatening his strike. And you know, this person didn't even wait that long. When he saw the trend moving against him, he panicked and got the hell out of Dodge. On November 26th, he bought all of these back for a buck 11. So, listeners, he sold them for 20 cents. He bought them back for a buck 11. You can do the math there. That's not exactly a profitable long-term trading strategy. In case you can't do the math, he dropped nearly a million bucks, about 900 grand on this trade. The stock, when he bought those puts back, was about 34.66. So it wasn't quite through his strike, but it was threatening it. So Mr. Meatball, this is a rare occurrence. We don't see a lot of these line in the sands come back to bite the seller that often. And usually when they do, they kind of ride them through expiration and they take the stock. In this case, this person got the heck out of Dodge. I can't really fault them. Maybe their analysis, their outlook for the underlying changed. Or maybe, dare I say it, they never really wanted the stock. They just wanted that 20 cents about 10,000 times. And when it became clear that was turning into a buck against them, they got the heck out of Dodge, Mr. Meatball. What say you? I think it's the latter, not the former. I don't think they ever wanted the stock. They probably were just looking for you know, uh, some easy, easy pennies and, to pick up thought this was one they could get after, and it did not go the way they were expecting. It did not. This is rare. I can only count on one hand probably the number of line in the sand puts that we've seen really blow up in the trader's face over the course of the past year, and this one would have to be one of them. So, And again, we'll come back to these uh, Ballard-powered puts when we get all that stuff analyzed. Meanwhile, though, it's that time of the week, listeners. It is time for the strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for The Strategy Block. All right, listeners, prepare yourself for some options, wit, and dare I say it, wisdom. It is time for Uncle Mike. Sir, what do you have in store for us today? Well, today I want to talk about buying the dip versus catching a falling knife. Uh, there is a distinct difference in the two. And um, on a day like today, a lot of people might be looking for opportunities or they might just be crying depending on where they are with their trades. And so I want to kind of expand upon how I'm looking at this right now <clears throat> and to see whether this is going to be a buying opportunity. So first things first, let's say, what does it mean to catch a falling knife? 
Uh, and this can apply to stocks, options, whatever you want to look at on here, or futures, uh, whatever way you want to go with this. Catching a falling knife is when the market is going straight down. <clears throat> and you're trying to just buy the dip, even though it's continuing to go down, 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 down. You want to buy. And so it's called catching a falling knife because as the market's going lower, you're, it's very difficult to buy the dip because it keeps dipping and dipping and dipping and you don't know where that is at that point in time. So the analogy of it catching the falling knife is picture a knife falling from a second story window and you're trying to grab the handle of that knife. Now, oftentimes you might never, you may not get the handle of that knife. You might get the blade, you might get cut and that could cause pain that you don't want. So that's what it means when you're trying to catch a falling knife. Now, with that being said, I personally prefer to buy markets after a dip on their way up because of the fact that uh, it's shown that the market can come back and we're not just in some type of horrible free fall. Now, does that mean that I'm always right? Good gosh, no. Everyone's been wrong as a trader at least once in their life, except for Mark Longo, of course. Uh, but what it does do is it gives me a little bit of confidence to know that I'm not the first person that's going to get his face ripped off if the market's going down lower. And so by letting the market come up, the pain of doing that is that you do miss a little bit of the upside. Of course, we'd all like to buy the exact bottom of every market. Not always going to happen. In fact, it rarely, seldom, if ever happens. I think I can, in the, I don't even know how many thousands of trades I've done in my life. I've probably bought the exact bottom, I don't know, maybe once or twice. And even then, I, it was never the exact bottom. But are there times to where there's opportunities and dips? Absolutely. Is today that opportunity? My honest sentiment is I don't know yet, and I'm going to make a decision a little bit later in the day. So with that being said, the first thing that I want to really emphasize or the point that I want to hit home today uh, as a point, not just as like a little bit of an educational blurb of what catching a falling knife actually is, but the first point that I want to take home today is that it's okay to miss a few points or a few ticks, whatever you're trading. And if you get some confirmation that the market actually is coming up and going your way, I personally feel that in the long run, that's a better way to go than just trying to buy on the way down. Now, with that being said, I'm talking about shorter term trades. If you're doing this for the long term, and let's say that this is a stock that you want to hold for the next 20 years, and you finally got the dip that you wanted today, bye, bye, bye. Uh, enjoy, have fun, get into that and you have a longer term time horizon. But if you're looking at a more shorter term time horizon, that's where I think it's important to get a little bit of confirmation to the upside on it because you don't have all that time, that 20 year time frame to hold on to the stock for that long of a period. Now, the next thing that I want to mention is what am I looking for today? Or what am I looking for in general when we have a dip or a down market like we have today? So my dream market in terms of my, my dream by the dip market, so to speak, or to put more deltas on the table or whatever you're looking at on it, would be when we have a dip and then we channel for a while. And then once we're channeling, what that tells me is that the sellers are no longer there. Uh, now, once again, this is just my theoretical trading and looking at things. But if the sellers are no longer there, then we're going sideways. Now, have the buyers come in yet? No. but we are at a point to where the sellers have at least subsided for a while. So what I personally like to do is when we have a dip and the sideways channel, it can go on for a day, it can go on for a week, a month, whatever the case may be, I personally like to make my decisions later in the day. And I might still do nothing today and wait to see if we can channel a little bit more tomorrow. There's a little more to it than that, which we don't have time to discuss today. But I like seeing the channeling market after a dip as a buying opportunity because of the fact that sellers have at least taken a break. They may or may not have gone away, but they have at least taken a break. And so by doing that, I actually have the ability to buy on a dip. And then if the market does go below the uh, flat line or the channeling point that I got into, well, then I need to make the decision, am I right or am I wrong? 
And I can make that decision fairly quickly. If it goes below the channeling point that I'm in, then I decide, okay, I'm wrong with this. Time to roll, move out, get out of the trade, whatever the case may be. There's all sorts of risk management techniques that we've talked about in the strategy block many times. But if it starts going up, then the plan at that point is what's the exit point to get out for a profit. So when looking at this, the two main points to consider are that it's okay to wait for a little bit of confirmation after the dip. And it's also okay to get out if your channel is going against you or if it goes below the channel that you're at. And you have a point to where you can buy the dip with a little bit of confirmation. And that is the strategy block for today, everybody. There we go. Your dose of strategy. Still got a few minutes here. So let's roll out to real quick mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right. Like I mentioned already, listeners, our question of the week is off to an interesting start. <laughs> it's, it's jumped up to two-thirds now, fully two-thirds of you saying, no, the meme stock wave is not dead. 28.9% uh, saying, yes, it is. And about 4.4% of you saying, I prefer crypto. Let's go out to the meatball because he kind of uh, helped to inspire this question of the week, him and a few others out there who've been asking this question a lot of late. Mr. Meatball, I have a feeling I know where you fall, but where do you fall on this whole, is the meme stock wave dead or not, sir? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like it, it's making its last gasp. I don't know that it's completely dead, I, but it definitely feels like we could, like AMC, GameStop are heading back to levels that at least make more sense, um, you know, back into the teens for AMC and, and I could see GameStop definitely below 100. And so that is something I'm definitely keeping an eye out. Uh, AMC in particular is kind of interesting today. I'm keeping an eye on that one uh, to see if it is going to uh, see if it's going to drop. We also got our chat here debating a lot of various UBXY trading strategies. <laughs> a lot of interesting ones going up. We got iron flies. We got your standard kind of puts and put flies. Here's an intriguing one from Mr. Luigi. He says he does, he sells ratio call spreads to the upside. So he sells one, buys two, tries to get them for somewhere around free or credit if possible. And he rides those up until he sees the worm starting to turn, he says. Then, because we know it, that could happen very quickly in UBXY. Just take a look at last week, listeners, if you need a reminder of that. And then he turns around to buy a five or 10 lot of a dime to 15 cent puts when he sees the candles turn south, as he said. Mr. Meatball, I know you like a little bit of UBXY. That's a different strategy than I've seen before. Selling ratios to the upside where you're buying two to the upside and then eventually buying some puts against it, sir. Yeah, that is an interesting strategy. That's not one that I've seen. I, I guess I get it. It's a you're riding the wave of volatility, uh, looking for skew to to get steeper. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, but like you said, as soon as this thing starts to turn the other way, you're going to get yourself a big truck. You're going to start losing money quickly if vol starts come in. That's not a set it and forget it trade. That's a I'm glued to my screen <laughs> throughout the day, waiting for the moment. You're long more. That that's a challenging road. Hey, if it's, if it's working for you, I have added out there, Mister Uncle Mike. Do you have any thoughts here on our question of the week? What do you feel about this whole meme stock palooza? Dead or no? Or in your case, I know you're really choosing our third option. You prefer crypto, sir? Exactly. Um, so no, I think that with the meme stocks, what what this makes me think of is, and I've referenced this a lot on the show, is the Princess Bride Battle of Wits scene. Is that, is it is the meme stock wave over? Uh, yeah, and looking at, I think it is. But that's just what they want you to think that it's over. And because of the fact that you would take the poison in one hand or the other, that's just what they wanted you to think. And so I agree with Mark, and that looks like it is in its final legs, but the only thing that I could say that would uh, contradict that would be that's just how they want you to think. And so... Um, don't mess with the Battle of Wits guy and Princess Bride. So I'm staying away from it either way. Inconceivable. As we keep on rolling right on into the Around the Block segment. 
It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Oh, I could do Princess Bride all day long. I am not left-handed. One of my favorite scenes of all time. It inspired me to become a fencer in my early days. Everyone who took it up with me, they all were inspired by that mountaintop fencing scene. In fact, our instructor said, you guys are all here because of the Princess Bride. We're like, yeah, we are. So, yes, a great movie all around. Also, Andre in one of his acting debuts there. So a little bit of 80s wrestling coming back. Speaking of coming back really quickly, I forgot to pay off our question of the week last week. We asked you a more difficult, a more dangerous question. Where will Bix close at the end of the year, which is rapidly approaching, listeners? A very simple. We didn't make you go for the range like we usually do. We just said, hey. A little bit elevated or perhaps not. Above 20 or below 20. And you guys, once again, very evenly split on this one. It went out at 53.5% for below 20 and only 46.5% for above 20. So, again, it's, it's a tight one. It's a contentious one. And once again, we are bucking that trend here, listeners, today. Let's go back around the horn. Let's start with the greasiest of meatballs. Do you have any favorite Princess Bride memories outside of Andre, of course? And then B, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of the week? Uh, yeah, was that a Billy Crystal and um, yes, yes, and uh, Carrie oh, Elway? It and, was uh, not Cindy Lauper. No, the was, one who was uh, in uh, House House of Cards. I'm blanking on her name. Roberts or something like that. Yeah, no, it was very that that whole scene was hilarious. Um, no, wasn't it Tracy Ullman that was his wife? Maybe. Um, oh, was, oh, Billy Crystal's wife. Yeah, it was Tracy Ullman. Yes. Yeah, no, I think I think I meant Princess Buttercup. Who was Princess Buttercup? Absolutely. Hilarious. Robin Wright. That's who that was. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, not Robin Wright. I was thinking of uh, Billy Crystal and and Tracy Ullman as the pair. There were absolutely hilarious. I forgot. Tra- uh, I forgot Tracy Ullman was in that movie. Wow, that's that's a yeah. that's an eighties pull. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, she brought us The Simpsons. Exactly. That's, that's her right. claim to fame. Brought us The Simpsons. Now she's done. Uh, so yeah, I want to see. I, I really think tomorrow is going to be a big day. Uh, I want to see where Vol, what Vol does today. Uh, it is really softened up, even as the market has just sat here. Uh, we're still down 64. The Russell's gotten a little stronger. Uh, I, I want to, you know, could we see a, a, an afternoon rally or an afternoon dumping? I don't know, but Vol is really, really coming in uh, in, in an aggressive way, which I think is is pretty fascinating. Yeah, that's kind of been surprising me to watch that. Certainly when we kicked off the show and it does continue to pace throughout the show, which again, that kind of belies the fact and we are seeing a rebound a little bit off the lows. So that certainly does it as well. That goes back to what we were saying before about ratios or any of these kind of spreads and things like UVXY and stuff. You got to be quick on the trigger on these things because the worm can turn on a dime like maybe perhaps we are, have already seen so far today. Remember that that period right after Omicron where we saw Vol State bid for a period of days <laughs> it's been very rare it's usually a few hours and you got to hit that while get out while the getting is good so intriguing stuff afoot mr uncle mike sir what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week 4500 is what i'm keeping an eye on today uh that's kind of been a tough number at the bottom side of this little december uh, range that we have going on here continuing to watch the 10-year note we're almost flat on the day with the 10-year note at this point in time so uh, it could be very interesting uh, to see that uh, there's just not a flight to safety happening. And we are roughly, and I mean, I know there's other factors involved with the VIX. I'm not trying to steal the meatballs thunder, but we're four point, we're almost uh, we're roughly three and a half points off the high of the day of the VIX. And uh, we're only, we're still down 68 points in the S&P. So uh, a lot of things to watch right now. and. Um, that's what I'm watching. All this talk has made me want to go watch The Princess Bride myself. I haven't seen that movie in ages, but good stuff. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we have come to the end, at least of this program. But if you're bemoaning the fact, you're saying, you know, I need more content in my life, in my ear holes right now. Well, don't worry. We're going to reset, rejigger a little bit, beam on some guests for our next show. So we're going to pause the live for a bit. We'll be back in exactly an hour. To talk all things crypto with a great guest coming up a little bit later today. Do you prefer crypto? Are you intrigued? Are you terrified by all these? All reasons to check out the crypto rundown coming up a little bit later today. But before we do that, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with the greasiest of meatballs because he did get the repo, man. Mr. Meatball, sir, if folks want to hit you up, 
about any of this stuff, like the worm turning and ball today, UBXY, any of this madness, meme stocks, they want to debate meme stocks with you, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, go to Ashpit.com and read our blog every day. Uh, today, I was writing about VIX and the fact that, you know, we're down 70 points and the nine of the 10 biggest trades were puts. Something for you guys to read about and learn from today. He's quite the blogger over there in the land of the pit. Uncle Mike, he's more of a tuber and a Twitterer these days. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, if folks want to check out your various media across various platforms, where should they go? What should they do? All over the map. Uh, so feel free to follow me on Twitter at Mike Tussaw, T-O-S-A-W. Uh, also, uh, continuing to work on the YouTube library of uh, new videos that will be up and running in 2022. So follow St. Charles, look up St. Charles Wealth Management on YouTube. Check out my website, stcharleswealth.com. I put out uh, blog material as well, uh, typically more for the longer term investor. But uh, if you're looking for a financial advisor who does have long term investment ideals, but also delves, uh, oftentimes lives in the option product, feel free to reach out to me. There you go. StCharlesWealth.com is the place to begin your journey. And remember, our journey continues in about an hour today with the Crypto Rundown. If you're listening after the fact, as I know many of you are, just hit next on your device of choice. Crypto Rundown should be waiting for you there tomorrow. For all you folks in the Secret Club, you get an awesome pro Q&A with the Viceroy himself. Pick his brain. You want to talk about 10-year notes like Uncle Mike. <laughs> Viceroy will talk some 10-year notes with you. As well as anything else under the Options Sun Wednesday, of course. Your double dose of education, Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio. Then we're back again on Thursday for Episode 2 of the Option Block. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>